Hello and welcome to the Mammal Podcast. I'm your host, David J.H. Wu, and today I interview Dr. Jason Ryan, legend of MedEd and founder of Boards and Beyond, one of the most popular education platforms for medical students across the world. We chat about Dr. Ryan's journey in creating Boards and Beyond, as well as his thoughts on how AI is going to affect both medicine and MedEd. To me, it was very inspiring to hear how his quest to improve medical student education led to a game-changing platform used by medical students across the world to distill complex concepts into easy-to-understand videos. Dr. Ryan is a very cool and humble guy. I hope you all enjoy. Hello, Dr. Ryan. Um, Welcome to the Mammal Podcast. So excited to have you on the show today. Uh, Our first question for you that we ask every guest is, can you tell us about your path? And for you, I'd like to make it a little special is uh, how you came to start Boards and Beyond and the journey behind that. Yeah, great question. It's a it's a fun story to tell. So um, a student I was I joined University of Connecticut in 2008 and I was giving lectures and the students told me they liked my teaching. I won some teaching awards and I had a student in my clinic uh, around 2013 or 14. And I was talking to him about how he studied and he showed me Pathoma, which you may know is another video resource. And uh, I was blown away by how simple it was. You know, it wasn't like high tech. This wasn't fancy Hollywood studio stuff. It was PowerPoint slides. And basically the strength of it was the narrator's explanations. You know, Hussein Sitar is very good at explaining things. Um, I think I teach a similar style to his and, um, it sort of was like a light bulb moment. Wow, maybe I could start recording some of my lectures. Uh, so that's what started me going, and I started looking into it. Uh, it was a much bigger undertaking than I ever knew. Uh, a website that streams videos behind a paywall and handles lots of users watching the videos at the same time, you know, costs thousands of dollars. So just launching it probably ended up costing me around $25,000. And I didn't know at the time if it was ever going to succeed. You know, this was like a leap of faith uh, to sort of invest uh, myself in. Um, And it launched in June of 2014 and no one bought it. You know, like you guys know, (laughs) nobody likes to use an untested resource. Uh, But, you know, I put a banner on the site that said, you know, email me if you're no one at your school has boards and beyond, I'll give you free access. And I just kept giving it away. And it was about four or five months later, I think the first person ever paid for it. I, I thought wow. I got an email saying <laughs> someone had signed up for the site. I, I think I thought it was spam, actually. I told my wife, said, what's this email or something? And I was like, oh, my God, someone actually paid for Boards and Beyond. It's incredible. Believe it. Um, and then it was another year of like, you know, three people a month buying it or, you know, real, but, but I saw that the video views were high because a lot of people had free accounts and they were watching the videos a lot. So it probably took me a year to make back the initial investment, which was a big relief. I felt like no matter what happens, you know, I, I didn't lose any money on, on this crazy endeavor. And and then, but I, I kept getting requests to make more content uh, and I kept adding content and probably after like two, two and a half years, it sort of crossed some tipping point where enough people had used it and told the classes behind them. And then it started to like snowball into getting to what it is today. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah, it, was, it was really wild. I never knew it would work out like this. And, you know, I just sort of had to have faith and it, luckily it all worked out. What was your initial vision, you know, behind starting it? Did, did you foresee that it would be kind of become the staple of med ed? No. I mean, I, I thought I would just be cardiology in the beginning, sort of like Pathoma was pathology. I would do cardiology. Um, but then students were saying, well, can't you add more stuff? And I've taught renal and pulmonary physiology to med students. So I thought, well, you know, I can do these. And then I had friends and other specialties and I asked them to look at my slides. And so I could teach things where I wasn't a total expert. Um, And luckily cardiology has exposure to a lot of other fields. Like, even though I don't diagnose lupus, you know, I see lupus patients and Mm -hmm. people with skin diseases and things come to my office. So, you know, I was familiar enough to talk about these topics. If someone sort of helped me get the science right with the slides. And so, you know, I just kept chipping away at it. Like on my lunch hour in the mornings, I'd make a video, I'd make some slides and, you know, add a few videos every month or so till it got to where it is now. I, I never knew it would get this big. Um, and it's been an amazing journey. That's beautiful. 
I feel like I should let our listeners know that you are currently doing this interview with the same microphone that you recorded <laughs> all of the videos yeah. uh, of Boards and Beyond on. And I was joking earlier right. that that microphone should be hung up in the Smithsonian. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's an incredibly low tech line of work. You know, the, it's an amazing age we live in with the Internet. So, I mean, I had to pay a lot of people to, to code the website and manage all that. But once you do that, the actual investment required to make a teaching video is is negligible. And that's why there's so many on YouTube. You know, the challenge nowadays, I think, is to find good content. But if you just yeah. want to find any content, there's tons of it out there. Now, I've noticed that for me as a student, the like anyone can make a video, but it's hard to make. A, I think there's much value in having, you know, one voice that is like one teacher that is, uh, I don't, I don't want to say homogenous, but you know, you kind of understand the format of each video. You kind of understand uh, how to glean what's important. Uh, whereas, you know, one of my qualms with MedEd is that it was so heterogeneous. You know, we'd have different PhD lectures in their niche fields, and they didn't know what we knew as students. And so it was very hard uh, to learn because they didn't really know us. And once we kind of synced to their teaching style, then we get a new lecture. So that's why I personally really appreciated Boards and Beyond. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I've always felt, even at UConn, I mean, we have lots of different lecturers and teachers just like your school does, but I always felt it would be best if they just found like 12 people to teach everything um, because I noticed that even when I made the videos, you know, I'd be in some biochemistry module on vitamin B12, and then I'd be making the hematology videos, and I'd be like, oh, I already have slides on this, and you know, I can make sure I say it the same way so that everyone gets that point emphasized. And there's a ton of things like that in medicine that cross over from one field to the next that if you're sort of involved in all the different areas, you see that. Yeah, I, I think it's cool how everything's interlinked. Like, like you said, with the lupus patient, you know, there's cardiology, there's immunology, there's derm, kind of in one condition, it's all interlinked. And that's just for lupus. And, you know, there's plenty yeah. of other examples. Yeah, immunology is a great example. I mean, obviously, I did not feel competent to teach immunology as a cardiologist. So I dusted off my old books and read about it. And I was amazed reading about it, how many tie-ins I saw to things I do every day. I, I just didn't realize they're immunology things. You know, we order blood tests that are antibodies and treatments are antibodies and white cell counts. And uh, and I talked to some people I know who are immunologists to get the content on the slides right. And that was really fun to do, like from the the attending perspective to go back and look at all those things. And I think, you know, it's nice to have someone teach you that, that has a lot of clinical exposure who can tie it in. What was it like making videos that were outside of your specialty? Was it kind of like going back to medical school or, you know, did, was it very enjoyable or was it kind of hard or? I mean, this probably shows kind of what a nerd I am, but it was kind of fun, actually, because I didn't have the pressure of having to learn it in a week for an exam that it might determine my career. So, you know, I could kind of go at my own pace. And a lot of these things you learn in first and second year make so much more sense after you've completed training and mm. you've been around the hospital and you see what all these different blood tests are used for. And so... Some things it was clear, like this is a really important concept that comes up a lot. Other things, it was also clear, like this is not an important concept. It's just something you have to learn as a first year. And you probably heard me say sometimes in the videos, like this doesn't have much clinical relevancy, but you know, they want you to know whatever. That Could you provide an has, example? Oh. Yeah, like the cell membrane has this lipid bilayer, whatever. I mean, <laughs> these things are not really critical to practicing medicine, you know, but sort of every med student goes through Krebs cycles, another one. Uh, so, you mm -hmm. know, but I, I, I let that influence the way I made the videos. I'd say, look, here's something you just kind of need to know for your board exam questions and, you know, make sure you know that. And other things I'd say, look, you know, this is going to come up a lot on your third year rotation in surgery or medicine or pediatrics. And so, you know, you want to keep this in the back of your mind. Wow. I was, could you continue with the story? So at around 2015, that's kind of when people started paying and then it started yeah. taking off and. Yeah. I mean, I made a ton of rookie mistakes launching. So in the beginning, there was only one subscription one year. It was like a hundred bucks and a lot of people wanted it for a month. So they wouldn't buy it, even though it was cheap, you know, they, so somewhere around after two years or so, some of my students told me like, Dr. Ryan, you got to offer like one week and one month and three months. And I said, oh yeah, that's a good idea. I can't believe I never thought of that. 
So I did that. Uh, and then that really helped a lot, you know, because I think a lot of people were considering it, but when they could only buy it for a year, they didn't. So mm. uh, it sort of started to get more popular. And then, you know, everyone comes back to school in August. So I think it was like 2017, there was an August where the sales just exploded, you know, so people obviously had been told by upperclassmen that it was a worthwhile resource. So that's when it really sort of hit its stride and, you know, started getting a lot of use. Wow. And, and then, uh, and then how, what about in the years after that? Like yeah. So uh, it kept getting bigger and bigger and it got harder and harder to be a full-time clinical cardiologist. And, you know, we'd have like the website would have a crash and on the same day I'd have a patient with, you know, chest pain or somebody <laughs> needs their refills. It was really, you know, it was like around 2019 or so it was really getting busy so I cut back on clinical work. And now I mostly just do teaching, a little bit of covering the hospital a few weeks a year. Uh, and that helped tremendously. Um, I took a pay cut for my job at UConn, but it was all right because the website was doing okay at that point. Um, and then that let me really focus on the website full time. So, you know, we finished the step one videos, finished the QBank, moved on to step two. And, you know, that's where it is today. It's got videos for step one and step two. I hired people to help me write the questions and support us stop being just me running the whole site. Cool thing is that's around when I started using boards and beyond was 2020 because I was using yeah. it for my yeah. step one boards for, <laughs> and it was, yeah. you know, recommended people, by classmates. Some people who like, used it back in the beginning are surprised when they see it now that how big, you know, they remember the old days when it was a much simpler website. I remember verbatim, a upperclassman told me, she said, uh, boards and beyond is all you need. Like Dr. Ryan, that's all you need to pass, <laughs> to pass your classes and that'll help yeah. you do well on step. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that can be true. I think it has all the information you need to know. You know, everybody's different. Some people like my teaching style. Some people don't. Some people will like more questions. So I, I wish I could say it's guaranteed to work for everyone, but you know, everybody's different, but I, I think it covers all what you need to know for step one. Just curious, how did you design the curriculum? Did you base it off of uh, like the USMLE step one requirements or did you kind of use your own intuition or? Yeah. I, I used first aid. So even when I was in med school, I never, I always wondered why my teachers didn't teach from first aid. It was a good book and it had, it's not like it, it left out a lot of concepts. I thought, why not just teach these concepts? So actually when I taught med students, even before boards and beyond, I built my lectures around first aid, you know, I'd make sure whatever they had on heart failure, I covered. So I just kept doing that, you know, I'd take a page in first aid and look at what they had about, you know, I don't know, cirrhosis, and then I'd make sure I covered those things in my videos. And that turned out to be a huge selling point because a lot of people yeah, use oh, it great. hand in hand with first aid. Uh, and that probably is one of the th biggest things that helped it succeed is people could just look at a page in first aid and then find a video to explain that to them. I just, I'm getting flashbacks now. Uh, you know, I took step one in 2020 and I guess, wow, almost three years ago now, but I, I'm getting flashbacks. I, I remember, I remember watching your videos and then finding the corresponding first aid page. Like, oh, wow, this is, a, you know, it clicked that, that what you just described right there, it clicked in my brain and it, it really helped me digest and process the information. Whereas I feel like with, uh, you know, my problem with school lectures is that they don't teach using first aid. And, you know, you'll get a lot of niche topics and they'll spend like three, uh, you know, three to four slides on some really obscure thing that is never going to show up. And, uh, you know, you kind of lose faith in the lecture itself. And wow, I, I feel like yeah. that's the beauty of First Aid or sorry, of Boards and Beyond. Yeah, I mean, I think First Aid is a great book. I, I kind of can't believe the boards don't publish it themselves. They ought to just put out a book because they'll say things yeah. like you need to know cardiac disease and that's not helpful because that's a million things but first aid gives it to you specifically like you need to know this thing about cardiac disease and uh, I think it's a great book it's a good model for what to build your foundation around and it's just not a teaching book it's really just a list of facts so I yeah that's it's true really good, good teaching thing yeah I feel like you really helped like add meat to it you know it was kind of had the bones and you really helped add the meat to it and to kind of like humanize yeah. it yeah, it's, it's funny. It'll even have like one bullet point on some obscure thing. I'd read it and say, why does it mention that? And then I'd look into it. And behind that bullet point, there were like a whole bunch of papers that came out five years ago. And then I realized like why they emphasize that point. And I can explain that to you in a video in the way they don't have room to do in first aid and say, look, this is why 
this little thing is important, you know, uh, because of these papers or whatever. And I think that helps give you context for why you need to know it. Mm -hmm. And so then recently you uh, sold Boards and Beyond to McGraw Hill. Is that correct? Yeah. That's Congratulations. Right. Yeah, last December. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was a big decision. Um, basically, the, the I, I took the, I ran the company with really like five full-time people. We had a lot of people we uh, used as contractors, physicians to write questions or review material. But, you know, I basically had a staff of five people. And, um, you know, the next level is like selling it to institutions and selling it around the world internationally. And, I mean, I was just never going to be able to do this on my own. Mm -hmm. So I kind of either had to keep it as a small company or hand it over to someone who could take it that next step. And uh, McGraw Hill was a good fit. They published first aid uh, and they were oh, actually wow. looking, they were looking for a video company to acquire that they could kind of mesh with first aid and their other medical education products. So it was like a perfect fit. Um, yeah. And they're really nice people. I'm staying on as a consultant for them. So I still, you know, work on the website, which is fun, but I don't have to like manage the contracts and the business side and all those details that aren't that much fun. So I, I think it's going to work out great. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like there's a, a pantheon of medical educators, you know, yeah. you being one of them, Dr. Sitar being another one of them. And it's it's yeah. great to see, you know the the your the story behind the the teaching. I think yeah. it's very inspiring. Yeah, it's been fun. It was it's like the classic American dream sort of thing. You have an idea, and I didn't know if it would work out, and it did. It's been a tremendous journey. I feel very fortunate that it went the way it did. So, what's next? What do you think? Yeah, well, what's still, your yeah. I still work at UConn. I still teach. I'm an advisor. Uh, I'm a consultant for McGraw Hill. So, you know, these things keep me busy enough and that plus, you know, my kids are 14 and 12 and I've got other things going on. So I, I think I'm pretty, pretty content for right now. Will you still be recording videos in the future? So we're working on that. Um, the eventually it needs to not be completely dependent on me. You know, that's not a long term <laughs> yeah. model for success. So we're going to recruit some other narrators, but in the short term, I probably will update some videos. You know, uh, I think they'll update the slides using like images directly from first aid. They'll really reemphasize that link between boards and beyond and first aid. And so I may re-record some videos. And then also part of my role is helping to recruit new content creators and try to find someone who's got the right speaking style and the right approach to sort of mm -hmm. match what I've done. Just curious, who were your favorite teachers when when you were doing your training? Uh, did you have, uh, for example, like we listened to Goljan, uh, Ed Goljan, mm -hmm. his podcasts are very popular. Yeah. Um, yeah. Me and my classmates, we listened to you, Dr. Sitar. I was wondering, were there any like equivalent, you know, kind of uh, large audience teachers uh, back in when you were learning? I mean, the the cool thing for your generation is that you have these sort of teachers that everyone can experience. I mean, I only got taught by the people at UConn where I went to medical school. Those were merely my only teachers. Um, it was really hard to learn. I mean, we had no cube banks. Like I got three weeks of dedicated for step one and I spent it reading Robin's pathology. I mean, that was all I could do. Wow. Um, so, you know, it was really hard to learn like that. You know, you basically just had to memorize textbook info and then hope you could turn it around and apply it on the test to questions, which would be different than anything you'd ever seen before. Wow. And so it's sort of no wonder that the average scores on step one were skyrocketing before it went past fail, because you guys have access to good educators and lots and lots of practice questions. So you are exposed to the question style before. So I, I did have some, I was always the kind of person who, who studied the lecturer's style and lecture, you know, I'd have a great teacher, like we had a great hematology teacher and I always sort of thought like, what is it that he does that is so good that makes it easy to understand. And when I had teachers that were really confusing, I would say like, oh, they're all over the map and they need to focus. And if they would just talk more about this, that would be better. So, you know, I picked up things over all my training from the people that taught me to become the teacher that I am now. What do you think makes a good teacher? 
I think that you need to understand your audience. So a lot of teachers, frankly, teach for themselves or for people <laughs> at their own level. You know, so they're, they're, funny, more yeah. up there to, they're, they're more up there to show you what they know, not to oh, man, get it funny. in a way that you understand. So whenever I'm asked to give a talk, you know, I want to know who the audience is, right? Because if I'm speaking to uh, nurses, I've given heart failure talks to nurses. That's obviously a very different talk than cardiology fellows or cardiology attendings. And that's a different talk than med students. So I want to know where my audience is at and, you know, what they can understand. And then you need the ability to go back and be in their shoes. You know, when you spend yeah. all day around cardiologists, it's very easy to just think that everyone in the world knows, you know, these terms like diastolic inflow velocity and left atrial dimension. <laughs> and But nobody knows that stuff, you know, except cardiologists who do it every day. So when you're talking to med students, you know, you have to say, okay, these guys, you know, may not have even known how the heart works a week ago. They just learned how it worked this week. You know, we're not going to be able to just go right to the highest level. And so I think if you know who your audience is and you put yourself in their shoes, those are like the first big steps to being an effective teacher. And I feel like uh, with great authors too, you need to know your audience. And yeah, for sure. It's like a, a talent. Textbooks, a lot of textbooks are written in a language. I, I even... It was funny making the videos for Boards and Beyond, you know, I dusted off old textbooks of mine and biochem and sometimes I couldn't even understand what they were trying to say, you know, and, and, and I've now been through all my training. I can only imagine for a new med student who, you know, probably maybe is insecure and not sure they're smart enough. And then they read this, they'll just feel like they're lost. And it's just got to do with the language that everybody uses. It's over people's heads often. Wow. That, uh, that reminds me of a, of a Bruce Lee quote where he says, uh, you need to Love be Bruce like Lee. water. And, yeah. you know, water conforms to the shape of any container that it yeah. is poured into. And so, you know, it's, I feel like being a good teacher, you need to be like water where a med right. student, you know, their knowledge base is a different shape than a cardiologist versus a resident. And it's that's kind of great that you are, you know, conforming to that shape and then I, I guess expanding it, you know. Yeah, I'll tell you a story. I, I did hematology clinic in med school as a second year student. And we saw this person with um, the lupus anticoagulant syndrome, you know, that hypercoagulable state. And mm -hmm. she had all the classic features of it. And it was so cool, a cool case. Um, and I said to the attending I was with, I said, this is amazing. Like, you should give us a lecture on lupus anticoagulant. It's really interesting. And he said, Jason, I did. I gave you a lecture on this two, two <laughs> months ago. Like, and I completely forgotten, you know. And so I always remember that. Because some of my colleagues will say, like, I can't believe these med students don't know renal physiology. We taught them that last year. And I say, well, that was a year ago. And, you know, if you don't use this stuff every day, you really quickly forget it. So that's another element of knowing your audience. You know, just because they took a course or had a lecture on something, if it wasn't recent and they're not using that information every day, they're not going to remember it. You're going to have to go back and sort of refresh. Mm. I feel like maybe that's the, you know, the beauty or one of the beautiful parts of Boards and Beyond is you really know your audience. And ha I feel like that's what, why the videos are so effective is because you kind of know where we're at and you're empathizing with where we're at. And, yeah. you know, you teach yeah. in a very friendly and approachable way. Right. Well, it's, it, video learning is a great way too, because you can go back and watch it again. I mean, I had some great lectures in med school, but I can never hear their lecture again. Sometimes mm. I wish I could. Uh, because they explain things very well. So I feel like we've talked about medicine and med ed, and mm -hmm. perhaps we should talk about uh, the AI and machine, you know, the, the mammal, the ML part of mammal. And I'm curious, you know, there's been a lot of new breakthroughs in AI. And actually, uh, the reason why I reached out to you to do this podcast is I saw you recently tweeted about ChatGBT and writing board style questions. Uh, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on the latest breakthroughs in AI, um, ChatGPT, and how do you think it's going to affect med ed? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I'm no expert, so I can only sort of tell you off the top of my head things I've noticed. But, um, you know, I went to ChatGPT and I asked it to create a USMLE style question on a certain topic. And it did an okay job. Uh, you know, it was pretty amazing that it could spit the question back to me in just a few seconds. I mean, that in and of itself is something that would take a human, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 minutes to do to compose the question and put it together with the answer explanation. So that was pretty amazing. Um, so, you know, in meta, there's a potential for you to ask it to put things together 
Um, I don't know where that'll go. I mean, the, the devil is still in the details. You know, like people always say, well, you know, you came along at the right time making your teaching videos. But the reality is when I made them, there were already millions of them out there on YouTube. You know, what I think me people liked boards and beyond was the way I explained things, you know. So whether or not, you know, med ed can do generate something that's not just similar to what a textbook would generate, whether it can generate something that really resonates with students and helps them understand the material, I think time will tell. But it's wide open now with people potentially using it for all sorts of things. And what are your thoughts on GPT-4 passing all of the USMLEs? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty impressive. Obviously, you know, it can it can come up with the answers to questions. And I've seen, you know, these are all anecdotal, but someone whose doctors couldn't make the diagnosis and chat GPT suggested a disease that turned out to be right. So, mm -hmm. you know, it definitely can play a role in, in making diagnoses, I think, if you give it the correct information. We'll just have to see where it goes. You know, I don't know if people want to talk to a human or want to talk to a computer. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, the medical legal aspects of it, if the computer makes a diagnosis, you know, who's responsible mm. and all that. But um, there's definitely a lot of medicine that's pretty straightforward. And people don't like to talk about this, but not every case is a head scratcher. <laughs> you know, this is all your vast medical knowledge. A, a lot of things I do are pretty straightforward, you know. Uh, so, you know, could you streamline that by, you know, having some AI interaction before the person sees the doctor to, you know, set it up for the doctor and make it easier and faster? I, I definitely think that's possible. Mm. And I feel like in the scope of uh, med ed, I feel like there's, we're at a, an inflection point in the sense that, you know, step one is pass fail. Um, uh, before, you know, there was rising board scores every, every year. It almost seemed like yeah. there was a, a cold war <laughs> in the yeah. sense that, or like an arms race, you know, the, the students yeah. would get better and better by at taking questions by using their uh, resources such as boards and beyond and new world. And then the USMLE had to get better and better at writing these, you know, third order, fourth order questions. <laughs> uh, um, and then now, you know, with chat GPT coming out, uh, it's, it seems like, I don't know, medical education is almost at like, uh, or even medicine is kind of at this weird, like, well, what do we do? Um, right. And I, I personally don't really know what to make of it either. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, what What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, um, this is pure conjecture. But you know, when I think to like a typical day in clinic, you know, if I see someone with chest pain, that's, you know, a cardiologist bread and butter sort of evaluating someone with chest pain. But I usually ask the same standard set of a dozen or so questions. You know, a lot of them are to identify red flags that might need mean someone needs to go to the emergency room right away. But 90% or more of the cases are not that, you know, most of them are something benign. Uh, and then, you know, we usually get an EKG and Sometimes we get a stress test, you know, but could you train an AI computer to do that? I think you probably could, you know, uh, there are other cases that are super hard. You know, the person that has advanced heart failure uh, on the transplant list. Um, there are no good treatment options. You're picking between multiple options that all carry great risk. There's, there's family dynamics. I mean, I can't see AI ever handling that type of situation because yeah. it's just so complex. But you certainly could skim off the straightforward sort of interactions um, that I could see a role for AI in, in taking care of some of those things that are pretty straightforward and uh, routine. A, a few years ago, a student, I interviewed students for the med school, a student had done a research project where they created a, an algorithm that people could use out in rural parts of India where there were no physicians or hospitals to identify which patients needed to be transferred in, you know, uh, so they could take various complaints and filter it through an algorithm and decide whether the patient could be monitored staying in their rural setting or needed to come in. And I feel like AI could do something like that, you know, could interact like that, especially in places where the physician workforce is overtaxed or something like that. Kind of like a triage bot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mm. certainly could see that, you know, because, the rea in all our practices, you know, a lot of the stuff is routine and you're trying to get to that 10% that's complicated where you really have to apply everything, you know, uh, but not every case is like that. Yeah. And I feel like there is a general um, zeitgeist or, or belief right, in the, you know, AI medicine space that uh, 
you they want to build AI that augments, not replaces, uh, and like yeah. trust but verify. And so uh, right. I, I'm I'm hopeful <laughs> that it'll that it'll be that you know that it'll be augmenting and not replacing. Um, right. I also wanted to get your thoughts on. Um, I'm kind of in the med ed space. So Saul Khan of Khan Academy, he recently announced mm -hmm. an AI tutor called Khan Migo. Um, mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to check that out or? No, I haven't had a chance to check it out. No. So apparently it's kind of going to be this like AI tutor that will speak to you in like a, you know, question and response format. And then it'll kind of understand where your understanding is at. And then based on that, it'll like ask questions or it'll kind of give you like real time personalized feedback. Uh, do you think maybe medical students will have personalized tutors like this one day or? Yeah, it's possible. Um, I tutor some students and, but what I often find is they don't need as much tutoring as they think, you know, they, they need tutoring to set them on the right path. Like maybe they're mm. studying the wrong way or they're not getting a certain thing. Uh, and they'll say, Dr. Ryan, can we meet like every week until I get this? And I'll say, okay, well, let's see how it goes. And after a week or two, they don't want to meet with me anymore because they've sort of figured out what they were getting wrong. And now they need to go and just drill videos or drill you world questions, you know, to really get it in their head. So I do, I do think there's a role for that for sure. Um, but I know there are companies that will offer you a personal tutor, you know, and I think that can be helpful for a certain type of learner. But a lot of times what people need is someone to just sort of help them organize their studying. Cause the reality is a lot of medicine is just, is just trench work. You know, it's just mm -hmm. learning the 15 murmurs you need to know, learning all the biochemical pathways, you know, no tutor can like has this magic answer to put that in your brains. The, the best example I can think of is EKGs. So a lot of students come to me and say, Dr. Ryan, I'm not good at EKGs. Can you help me? And, you know, I say, sure, do a cardiology fellowship, then, then you'll be good at EKGs, because <laughs> you can't be good. I was never good at these until I started looking at them every day, you know, and the same is true for x-rays and blood gases and all sorts of things, you know, there's no like secret sauce that if someone just tells it to you, all of a sudden mm -hmm. you untie the knot and it's easy. It, it's just, you just got to do it sort of every day. So yeah, we'll see, you know, but there's a limited role to tutors when things just require doing stuff over and over and over again to get good at it. That makes sense. You can't, you can't replace hard work, right? <laughs> You, you can't, uh, you know, I remember my dad taught me to drive on a clutch, you know, nobody has a clutch anymore, but I watched mm -hmm. him do it. And I thought like, oh my God, how did you do that? And like a year later I was doing it, but it wasn't because like he explained it to me in some magic. It was just because I drove the car for a year. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there, there are certain things that are experiential and, you know, it's nice when someone explains it to you. So it makes sense, but you still have to do the hard work of just practicing it over and over again on your own. Mm, I like that a lot. I'm starting an intern year soon and actually in about a month and or six weeks. <laughs> so it, it's yeah. kind of comforting to hear that you just kind of have to learn by doing. You really do. I mean, a month, a month, nothing will replace a month on the wards. And like, what are you going to study now? I mean, who knows what you'll see in your first month? You, you could memorize something and never see a case of that the whole month. So you really just have to do it. And so much of medicine is repetitional. It's stuff we do every mm -hmm. day. That's how we get good at it. It's not from the book learning or the videos or the questions. It's just from doing it over and over again. I do remember seeing one of your tweets where you said something uh, similar to that, where you said, uh, you know, most of your training comes after graduation and after residency. First, yeah. The first five years is when you really learn to become a doctor because, you know, and like in fellowship, I was focused a lot more on acute care. You know, there's a lot of STEMIs and shock and things like that. And, you know, then I got into uh, being an attending and, you know, someone comes to me with a history of, a few, three heart palpitations, but they're otherwise completely healthy. I mean, this is not something I saw every day in fellowship or there's problems where meds interact that I hadn't prescribed before. Uh, all sorts of things just you cannot possibly see till you become an attending and have your own panel of a thousand patients with a thousand different problems. And so I really think you peak at like five years and, you know, all the training before that is nice to prepare you, but ultimately you just got to get into it and do it. Uh, how... I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of curious for my own sake, but when you do, you know, kind of at that stage, when you are presented with something you've never seen before, how do you react or what, what is your strategy? I mean, you have to ask for a lot of help. You know, I, I looked so many things up. I still do, but definitely my first five years, I was constantly looking things up. 
Um, I was constantly talking to other colleagues. I kept in touch with some of my attendings from fellowship and I would text them or, or email them with questions about certain things. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a lot of that type of work in your first five years to sort of get your feet wet until you've seen, you know, 10 cases of whatever this drug interaction before or this mm -hmm. symptom complaint that you need to work up. I, I like that. It's like, a, it takes a village. It does for sure. Where, I mean, wherever you go to practice, you want to find out who the like senior people are, make sure they're nice and approachable because they're going to be huge resources to say, you know, look, I've got this situation and I'm not sure what to do. And they'll say, okay, look, here's your options. You know, that, that actually takes me to my next question. I was wondering how has mentorship shaped your path? My, my own path? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, most of my mentors taught me cardio. I didn't have a lot of like life mentors who were, you know, like you should get married and move here and, and do this, you know, but I had great training. I trained at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. Cardiology fellowship was one of the highlights of my life. It was such a fun time. I love the attendings. I love my co-fellows, uh, big, busy hospital. And I mean, I learned so much from just watching the attendings. Um, there were some that, I said, okay, I never want to be like that person. Like there was like, a, that was like an opposite role model. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. there were, there were lots that were like fantastic role models. There were other people I took pieces of the way they practiced because I liked it. And so I just observed all of them to become, you know, who I wanted to be as an attending. Mm. It feels like, um, <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking about how like AI models are trained and how, they use like examples and training data. It's almost kind of like us as like human humans, you know, human intelligence yeah. is going through life. We, we learn through these different scenarios that we're put in. And I, I don't know, I think it's, it's very beautiful kind of how, like how that happens. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of medicine is, I hate to say this, but there's a degree of personality, you know, there are some mm -hmm. attendings who will just do, surgeries and stents and things on almost anybody there are others who are very conservative and there's some in the middle and so you have to observe that and sort of decide you know where you come down and where your personality is because a lot of cases are gray they're not like you'd love to think that every case it's clear cut you know just like a u world question there's one right mm -hmm. answer but that's not that's almost never the case a lot of times there's multiple ways you could go it depends on the patient and their goals and so i watched how attendings navigated this to come up with my own style Mm. Taking it back to, um, you know, med ed, um, talking about medical school, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Do you think medical school preclinical curriculum could be shortened? Uh, you know, right now the tradition is like two plus two. Uh, do you think that this could be shortened? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the whole thing is kind of crazy. It's just too much training. You know, you do four years of college four years of medical school, three years minimum of residency. It's just this enormous, huge, gargantuan path, and it can definitely be shortened. I don't know how short you could make it. People have argued with me, this many years is a minimum, or this many years is too much, and I don't know where the line is, but um, you know, the preclinical stuff in particular, now that you can learn so much of it on your own, you know, I really wish there was a way for students to demonstrate their aptitude and show like, look, I've learned biochemistry, you know, I can mm -hmm. prove it to you, give me an exam or whatever. And then you yeah. could kind of opt out on that and move ahead faster. Mm -hmm. The way our institutions are built, it just doesn't work that way. You know, you come in as a class and you all move forward as one unit. It's not really built to let a part of the class move forward and a part of the class stay behind. Um, but, you know, it's clear to me, and I think anyone who's honest with themselves that, you can learn pretty much all the preclinical stuff on your own if you wanted to. Maybe there's some things like practicing the physical exam or the history that, you know, you need to do in person, but a lot of it you could just learn on your own because then you get to the real learning, which is in third year where, you know, you're actually seeing real patients, which are not like board questions and very yeah. different. And, you know, that's where you're really learning to think like a clinician and operate within our medical system. I was actually thinking recently with the step one going pass fail, uh, you know, maybe that could be, like you said, a, a checkpoint, you know, for, um, I don't know. I was thinking like, what if, what if step one was the prerequisite to get into medical school or kind of something crazy like that. And then afterwards you would start in-person instruction. 
for like a brief preclinical phase and then do third and fourth year? I, I mean, I, I think that could clearly work. The, the problem is, you know, medical schools are just so big, such big entrenched operations. Yeah. Thousands of faculty invested in the current model. It's not easy to like upend it like that. Um, but you know, like I said, if when you, I think when your generation runs the med schools, there's going to be more of an opportunity for change, you know, because you think about it, I mean, Boards and Beyond is not even 10 years old, your world's like not even 10 years old. So, you know, when your generation is the deans and assistant deans and the program directors, you know, somebody may say like, okay, wait a second, like, do we really need to, you know, have a month of lectures on basic foundational stuff that they can learn online? Mm -hmm. Maybe someone will start to change that. But it is, it is a very complicated web of people and roles that's hard to just switch to a different path. Yeah. And I'll be honest, the bulk of my medical education, or at least my preclinical was provided by you and Dr. Sitar and, um, and uh, sketchy farm, sketchy, yeah, right. sketchy uh, micro. And I, I guess, so I started in 2019 and then the pandemic hit halfway or by the tail end of my first year. So I had a mix of both in-person and virtual. And then pretty much all of second year, I'll be honest, I didn't really go to medical, you know, to lectures of my own school and I use boards and beyond. And I feel like it's definitely a possibility to just, do the bulk of the preclinical curriculum asynchronous, asynchronously at home and not have to pay yeah. medical school tuition, you know? I mean, you could do it in college, you know, I wish because yeah. the, the college years are sort of forgotten as part of your training, but you know, those four years, you know, you could be a pre-med and take a lot of this coursework and, you know, be ready for step one when you start med school instead of sort of waiting till you get there. But again, it's set up the way it is through a lot of work and a lot of people. So Mm. So this is a closing question that we ask every guest. I was wondering, what do you think the future of AI and medicine will look like in 10 to 20 years? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I don't know the answer. I, I would be surprised if people don't find ways to integrate it into triage type things, you know? uh to ask questions and you know put together some sort of information for the physician that explains the patient and you know almost like like when i have clinic with a really good fellow you know they go and see the patient and come and present it to me in like one minute and i know everything that's going on because they're good and they're thorough and they know what i need to know um and it's really helpful then i can go in and just you know confirm a few key facts and explain the plan and see if the patient has any questions and I, I see, feel like that is such low hanging fruit for something like AI to tackle, you know, especially when people are waiting in the emergency room, waiting room, you know, and there's 30 people mm. waiting, you know, some kind of AI interface that could, you know, move you along like that uh, could be huge. Um, beyond that, I don't know, we'll see. I mean, because there, there's a huge human dimension, like how much will humans put up with, you know, do they, will they get upset if they don't see a, a doctor and they only talk to a computer and it tells them, you know, I'm calling in an antibiotic for you, go pick it up at the pharmacy. I, I don't know how people will react to that, even though yeah. the, the studies may show that computers just as reliable or even better than the doctor. I just don't know how people will react. Mm. What advice would you give to medical students today? Um, have these new advances in technology changed the game or is the process fundamentally the same? I think the process at right now, the process is still the same. And, you know, my advice to medical students is, is usually not around studying or anything like that. It's to just lower the stakes for yourself. Um, med school can feel super competitive. Unfortunately, the people that get in are really bright. Everyone's always talking about how much work they've done and what their test score was and what specialty they're going into. And, you know, you can be burned out by the end of second year from all that noise. So I always tell people like, you're going to be fine. You've joined a great profession. Your future is secure and try not to listen too much to all the uh, competitiveness around you and just focus on learning medicine. Mm. And I'm curious when you were in medical school, was there like a, a doom and gloom? Cause I feel like there's like a cyclical kind of like doom and gloom, like, uh, you know what I mean? Like right now, like med students, a lot of people are worried that Either AI is going to replace us. Uh, actually, one of our listener questions, uh, one of my classmates, he wanted to ask you, like, do you think ChatGPT is going to replace me? <laughs> um, but, you know, were, yeah. were there things that, uh, I guess, like doomsday prophecies when you were in medical training and did those come to pass? 
Yes, for sure. So there's always been doom and gloom about medicine since probably the 1980s. So in the 80s, the HMOs and insurance companies got big and they started controlling what doctors could do. So my grandmother was a physician, actually, she died like 20 years ago. But um, and when I told her I was going to apply to medical school, she said, don't do it. You know, it's being ruined by HMOs. And, and she introduced me to some other people she knew who I could talk to. And they said the same thing. They said like, this profession is ruined. So this was like 1994. So wow. obviously, you know, this hasn't happened. So these rumors that like medicine is going to, you know, bottom out have always been there and haven't come to pass. So I don't think if you like the profession, you should go into it. There's always going to be a role for doctors. It may change, but it'll always be there. For the AI thing, I mean, I don't see any way, I can't imagine any way AI replaces procedures. I just can't see robots doing, uh, you know, gallbladder surgery and hernia yeah. surgeries and things. I think that if you're a proceduralist, you know, no AI is going to replace you. Where it could replace is some of the, the purely diagnostic fields, you know, where you look at a MRI and just say, yep, there's a mass in the colon, you know, maybe a computer could do that. Um, but I still think like it's probably just going to change the role of the physician so that, you know, you don't look at every single MRI, but you look at the 10% that get flagged and, you know, those ones really have complex diagnostic needs. So mm -hmm. it'll evolve over time. You know, I think if you're a well-trained doctor and you're good and your patients like you, there's always going to be a role for you. Mm. And, and I also wanted to ask, uh, these are our, our last three questions. And uh -huh. these questions I actually got from an oncologist that I was working with. And he liked to ask these to his patients to uh, kind okay. of learn about them as, as humans. And I, and I really like them. And I feel like, you know, with this podcast, one of the things that I like to do is kind of learn about the humans behind uh, who are leading, you know, the medicine and machine learning space. And uh, there's three questions are number one, uh, what brings you joy? Uh, number two, what gives your life meaning? And number three, what are your greatest fears? And feel free to answer or not, but yeah, they're optional. Those are, those are big questions. Um, I mean, I, I get a lot of meaning from, this is cliche, but from my work and my family, you know? So I'm very happy that the Boards of Beyond videos are popular with bright students like you. And when I hear people telling me, that it helped them learn something they couldn't understand before, you know, that always makes me really happy. And I'm really proud of that achievement. And I love my family and I love our kids and I love our times together. I mean, these are the things that really bring me joy. Um, what were your other, what were the other questions? Uh, number one is what, yeah, what brings you joy? What gives your life meaning? And number three is what are your greatest fears? Yeah. I mean, and what gives my life meaning is the same things, you know, I mean, I like to see my work, uh, you know, be sad, be successful. You know, I like to see my children go up. These are just things that make me happy all the time. Uh, I don't know what my greatest fears are, you know, I mean, I guess it's, you know, nuclear war and climate change and all the usual things. Um, but I mean, I also know, like you were talking about this in medicine, how there's always been a gloom and doom, like people have always been saying the world's about to end for thousands of years. Yeah, and it hasn't. So, so I read a lot of nonfiction books, I've read a lot of books in the Middle Ages. And I'm always amazed that, like, if you'd lived back then, you would have thought the world was hopeless. You know, mm -hmm. there's plague killing half your village in a month and things like that. So like if people got through that, right, we're going to get through whatever we're going through. So, but, you know, those are things that, you know, I hope the future of the world is is bright and peaceful. What are some of your favorite books on the Middle Ages? Uh, there's a great book called... Uh, uh, by Barbara Tucker. It's called uh, something about the mirror. I forgot the name, but it describes this guy who went through the whole 14th century and what his life was like. And um, it's like a real life Game of Thrones picture, you know, and you're just so glad you don't live back then when like no one lived past 40 years old and, mm -hmm. you know, a group of thugs could come in and just kill half your village for no reason <laughs> and there was no stopping them. Uh, so those were fantastic. Uh, that's a really good book. There's a great biography on Martin Luther. You know, he started the Protestant religion and mm -hmm. what his life was like dominated by the Catholic Church and all those sorts of things. So uh, I could talk mm -hmm. about it forever if you want. Uh, I actually recently read The Confessions of St. Augustine. Uh -huh. and I, I think he lived in like the 400s or something, but um, yeah. it was kind of funny or cool to read his, they're kind of like autobiography and it's like, wow, this guy is, he's just a normal guy just like us, you know, he, like the stuff that he goes through, the things that he's worried about and, you know, he's, thinks that like some people are, are phonies and fakes and um, 
you know, like the people in power are, you know, abusing their power. And it's like, wow, you know, th I feel like th there is like a cyclical component to the human condition. Kind of. For sure. And, and, you know, one of the best things about reading biographies of famous historical figures is to just realize how normal they are, how similar they are to you. Mm -hmm. um, I read a biography on George Washington and, um, I mean, he was like a vain guy. He cared all about his clothes and how he looked. Oh, really? and, he, and he wasn't he wasn't very successful in the British Army before the Revolutionary War. He didn't think his career was going anywhere. You know, so he just happened to be in, you know, the major general after the revolution that was siding with the colonies. And, you know, it led to this whole life. And you can read it. Th Winston Churchill's life is amazing. I mean, he, he should have died in Africa in this war on horseback when he was like a teenager. Mm -hmm. He almost got killed and he managed to survive. And then he was, you know, prime minister during World War II and fought Hitler and everything. And so you read about all these guys and they have, they have fights with their kids, with their spouses. <laughs> Uh, you know, they get depressed, they get overexcited. Yeah. And, and it's just amazing to read that and see how normal everybody is, even these mythological, mythological figures from the past. That makes me think of Ulysses S. Grant. He, yeah. I, I read his autobiography and yeah, like, like similar to Winston Churchill, he, he almost died um, during like, you know, he was, he was in the Mexican American war with like Robert E. Lee. They were on the same side. That's right. And yeah, then during right. One random war, I was in the. I remember reading the chapter. I was like, "This is crazy." He was like sleeping in a steamboat or something, and then like his uh, one of his friends called him, like, "Hey, get up! We need to like we're going to battle." And he like gets up, and then thirty seconds after he gets up, like a cannonball comes through and goes right through the pillow where his head was. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, "Right, like, oh, I I, sh I could have died right there." And a yeah. another part too was like when he was, I think in his mid thirties. This was before the Civil War began. He was. Uh, he was selling firewood on the streets of St. Louis because his like jobs or his, he had tried to be a lawyer and that went bust. And then he tried to be a farmer and that went bust. And so he was just kind of like a schmuck selling firewood, not <laughs> yeah. really sure what he wanted to do with his life. And then, and then the country went to civil war and he signed up. And then because he had experience right. in the Mexican American war, the like quickly ascended right. the ranks and the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. He's a great story. Uh, there's a battle in the Civil War where he really became famous, the Battle of Shiloh. And it was like a multi-day war. And after the first couple of days, it really looked bad, like they might not win. And this other general went to tell him like that they should retreat. They weren't going to win. And it was pouring rain. And Grant was smoking a cigar in the rain, pacing and just muttering it to himself. Like, I will not lose. I will not lose. I will not lose. And so the guy backed off. He said, all right, I'm, I'm not going to tell him to retreat. He's, he's too worked up. Anyway, the next day they turned the tide and he won the battle. But I always have that picture of him like in the pouring rain, puffing on his cigar, like refusing to back down in the face of overwhelming odds, you know, uh, that, that like, it's just that, that made his whole life, you know, winning that yeah. victory got him noticed by Abraham Lincoln and he ended up being put in charge of all the forces. So it was a big deal. I kind of want to ask one last question, uh, yeah. because, you know, so many, so much of our audience is in medicine and I feel like this would apply to anyone, but I'm curious, uh, what was your lowest low in your professional career? Um, and how did you overcome it? Um, I mean, I don't know that I had some like horrible, you know, low, like a character in a movie where they are out in the gutter and pull themselves up or anything like that. But um, uh, there was a, one of our second or third tests of first year was neuroscience. Um, and, and I barely passed, like I almost failed it. And, you know, every, I, I had come from an engineering background and most of my classmates were pre-meds and they had taken biochem and anatomy and neuroscience and you know, I never really thought of quitting, but I remember thinking like, am I just always going to be doomed, you know, because I didn't come from the right background. And the funny thing about that is now that I'm an advisor, I don't know anyone who feels like their background was right for medicine. They, everyone comes and says, oh, you know, I was pre-med and I should have been this major. And then, you know, I would know more stuff about how to think critically or, you know, I was a history major. I should have been a science major. Like everyone feels like their background is is somehow deficient compared to everyone else but i definitely had that feeling um uh so it was usually around exams i mean there were a couple patients who did poorly where i'm not the kind of person who when a patient does poorly i just go well it wasn't my fault i did whatever i could you know i always like go over in my head like what could i have done differently and there were ones where i sort of wished i had tried to do certain things sooner and, and those gave me pause but there were never any hugely I really like training I don't know if 
other people don't feel this way, but like I loved third year medicine. I loved internship. I loved fellowship. It was just felt like a kid in a candy store getting to see all these cool things. So I had moments where I was frustrated with myself that things didn't go well, but I never had a super low moment of doubt where I thought about quitting or anything mm. like that. Any moments of doubt with boards and beyond? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, it was so expensive to start. And, you know, like I said, for months, no one was buying it, you know, and I was like, oh, geez, did I just blow all our savings to build this <laughs> website that, you know, I'm just going to take down in two years and, and it'll never have gone anywhere. So I, I definitely had moments of doubt there uh, for sure. What made you not take it down? Well, like I said, I could see people were watching the videos and I had students at UConn, I gave it to the UConn students for free and they were telling me they really liked it. So I was getting this feedback that people liked it. So I just kind of kept going, but I did worry, like, would people ever sort of start paying for it, you know, so that I could justify spending all this time and money on this fancy website. And I didn't know if that day would ever come, but it finally did. Well, that day's here. Yeah. And we've, I guess yeah. we've come full circle and you recently sold it to McGraw Hill, and I feel like that's a it's a beautiful story. Yeah, no, it's been it's been a wild ride, and uh, I feel so fortunate that it all worked out this way. Yeah, it was really fun. Not always fun in the beginning, but you know, now looking back, very fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ryan, for coming onto the show. Uh, really appreciated having you, uh, and it was very inspiring. Yeah, good. Yeah, no, super fun conversation. Thanks a lot for having me, David. I appreciate it.